much, Lisa. I am uh, pleased to introduce our, our keynote speaker for the day, uh, Mr. Peter Zion. Uh, Peter is a geopolitical strategist and critically acclaimed New York Times best-selling author. In his career, Peter worked for the Center for Political Strategic Studies under Susan Eisenhower and the State Department abroad. In addition, Peter is part of the core team that built Stratfor into a geopolitical consultancy powerhouse as the firm's vice president of analysis, and in 2012 launched Zion and Geopolitics uh, with a unique expert skill set of understanding demography, energy, technology, politics, and economics. Peter breaks down and predicts many of tomorrow's headlines today and helps people understand how the world works so they can prepare for a now more understandable future. In his first book, The Accidental Superpower, published in November 2014, Peter predicted Russia's attack on Ukraine today and has since published several books, including his latest book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization, which all of you received and signed a copy of late last evening. If you did not get one, we will make sure that you do get one. So uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Peter Zion. Good morning, everybody. It has been a weird, weird year. Now, I was requested to uh, stir things up a little bit this morning. Apparently, you're going to be talking a lot about best practices and ESG later, and apparently it's going to be a bit of a scrum, so this is my contribution. <laughs> Let's start with the war. I'm going to give you a lot to work on here with oil and gas and wind and solar and transmission, uh, but it all really comes down to the breakdown of the support structures that make everything else possible. That's what you're going to be wrestling with. What you've got on the right here is a population density map of the Russian space. Uh, north is to the right, so if you have to tilt your head, that's fine. That uh, orange V going from Central Europe into Central Siberia, that's where everybody lives. If you go to the left map, same zone, but now instead of population density, it's an economic and climate map. And on that left map, the green is the Russian wheat belt. That's where you live if you live in Russia. The weather is atrocious, you get about 20 hours of sunlight, for the entire month of December, based on where you are. Cold, low productivity per acre. And when you don't get a lot of income from a wide swath of territory, infrastructure is impossible to build. So Russia, even today, does not have a national road network. You want to move stuff? It's rail or nothing. If you go to the right, to the blue, to the north, that's tundra and tegai. Nobody lives there. You go to the left, to the yellow, to the south, that's desert. No one lives there. Now, when Russians look at this, they get really depressed. Not so much by the blue or the yellow or the green, but the beige. Territories that are not economically viable, but aren't really barriers either. Territories where it's really easy to shove a panzer division or a Mongol horde through. And since they're not mobile within their own territories, what has happened 50 odd times in their history is someone has crossed the beige into the green and they just rampage until Russia's weather defeats them. That's the typical Russian story. So what the Russians have always tried to do is to push out of the green, past the beige, until they can reach these geographic, geographic blocking points. The Carpathian Mountains, the Alma-Ata Mountains, the deserts of the Karakum. If they can do that, geography helps with their defense, a forward defense. And then they forward station static troops, because they're not mobile, in the access points between those barriers. 50-odd invasions, all of them have come through one of these access points. Now, today, the Russians are a little depressed, because at the Soviet height, they controlled all those access points. When the Soviet system collapsed, they only controlled one. And everything that Putin has done in the last 22 years in his foreign policy has been about rebuilding those military footprints in those blue arcs. This is the Crimea War, the Georgia War, the Nagorno War, the Kazakh intervention. Ukraine is just unfortunate to be on the path to two of those access points. So it's not that the Russians won't stop until they have all of Ukraine. It's that the Russians won't stop when they have all of Ukraine. We're only in like stage four or five of a nine part plan here. Where are my Texans? It's not as big as you think. 
Just the scale of what the Russians are attempting here boggles the mind. I mean, from their core populations around Moscow, they've got to cross two Texans to get to where they need to go. That's big. Okay, here's where we are right now. The deep red are the territories the Russians controlled on the first day of the war. These are territories they grabbed back in the Donbass War of 2014. The pinkish areas are the territories they controlled on the first of this month. As you may have noticed, a lot of crap's gone down in the last few weeks. Now, the original Ukrainian plan was to move on these two bridges. These are the only two bridges that connect that sliver. Can I point this? Yeah, there. Oh, never mind. I'll just go point. The two bridges are the only parts of infrastructure that connect southern Ukraine to this chunk of occupied territory west of the Dnieper River. Only those two. And so what the Ukrainians have been doing is thinking that if they damage those bridges so they can't be used for heavy equipment, which they've done, then any Russian troops north of them are going to be fighting on their own. Difficult to reinforce, difficult to evacuate. So they advertised for two and a half months that this was imminent. And the Russians moved about 20,000 troops from other parts of the front to this zone, knowing that they were going to need more bodies and pre-positioned equipment in order to fight off that assault. That assault started two weeks ago. What the Ukrainians then did is looked at where the Russians pulled their troops from over here in the east and hit that hard. And that's where the front collapsed. That's Kharkiv province. And everything between those two areas is now back in Ukrainian hands. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory for the war to this point so you can understand the significance of this and what it means moving forward. You guys remember the assault on Kiev in the first week of the war when there was that 40 mile long convoy of forces? You guys remember how on the third day of the war the convoy stalled out because they forgot fuel? <laughs> and on the seventh day, all the soldiers dismounted and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. Now, everyone took their own lessons from this. The NATO lesson was that the Russians are incapable of fighting a modern combined war conflict. They are incompetent at operating above a post-World War II level of technology, which means if we have a direct NATO-Russia fight, they'll be obliterated. But the Russians see this as a fight for their existential survival. So all tools are on the table. So if the Russians do succeed in conquering Ukraine, they will then come for Romania, Poland, and the rest, NATO allies. And nukes will be their only option. So NATO is sending every possible weapon system that we can to the Ukrainians that they can use as fast as they can learn to use them because we have to kill the Russian war machine in Ukraine. This is where Russia's future is decided. This is where NATO's future is decided in Ukraine. We can't have a direct fight. It's got to be the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians and the Russians took different lessons. The Ukrainians had a national consolidation around the defeat at Kiev and have been kicking some serious ass since. The Russians now realize that their propaganda was just that propaganda, and the Ukrainians are never going to welcome them in. Welcome them in. And if the Ukrainians are not wayward Russians who are going to come back into the fold, they are the enemy. And so the policy of genocide started. And the Russians began uh, advancing slowly, no more than a mile a day, behind an unfaltering wave of artillery bombardment. And in two months, they fired over two and a half million shells, which is about how many were fired in a year in World War II. The goal is simple. Target every single piece of civilian infrastructure you see to make the land uninhabitable. And that way, the population self-selects into two groups. Group one runs. They become refugees. You never have to worry about them again. Group two are fighters, and you can kill them on sight. So once the army moves forward, the Wagner group, the mercenaries, and the Chechen forces come in and just cleanse the area. We don't have firm numbers because very little of the territory even now has been liberated, but best guess is about a quarter of a million Ukrainians have been kidnapped and taken to Siberia, mostly children. And at least that many, again, have been killed. Again, we just don't know. We do know from German radio intercepts that the atrocities that were ever uncovered at Bucha after the Kiev withdrawal and at Izmen after the um, <clears throat> Kharkiv withdrawal are only two of about 90 examples of what has happened in occupied territory so far. 
Uh, it's gotten to the point that the United Nations and various NGOs have literally run out of staff to investigate the war crimes that they've already found in just the first week after the liberation in Izmir. The Russians are, making, are not making any effort to hide it. Okay, that's where we are right now. For the Ukrainians to win this war, not only does the balance of forces continue need to need to tip in their advantage, uh, three things have to happen. Number one, they need a lot more equipment. Now, obviously, the West is pushing on that as fast as it fe finds feasible. Everyone's going to have their own opinion about what weapon system and what time frame. And that's important. More important is that the Ukrainians get equipment that they can actually use quickly without additional training. So we're in the process of training up tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers across NATO countries. The first batch of 5,000 just went back to Ukraine last week. But more important is that the several million Ukrainians under arms actually get arms they can use. That's not long-range artillery. That's not fighter jets. That's not tanks. That's former Soviet stuff. And one of the best things that happened as part of the Izumin assault is this little cluster right here, this little tip, that's Izmin. That is the place that the Russians were planning on doing a spider web of attacks from pushing west into Ukraine proper. And they ran. And they left. Everything. And so in one day, the Ukrainians got more weapons transfers from the Russians than the West has given Ukraine in six months. They doubled the number of tanks they have overnight, and they're tanks they know how to use. And they're now starting to use them. There's a lot of deferred maintenance that needed to be done. <laughs> but they're working on it. For the Ukrainians to win this war, we don't just need another Kharkiv. We need 20 of them. The scale of the territory here is huge. Ukraine is roughly the same size as Texas. And they have to destroy the Russians' capacity to fight. Russia has fought 50-odd wars. Weather has won most of those. It's a waiting game with the Russians. So if the Ukrainians are going to pull this off, they have to destroy the ability of the Russians to fight in the first place. That has never happened without at least a half a million battlefield deaths. At most, we're at 70 right now. The way you do that is you blow up this piece of infrastructure in the south. This is the Kerch Bridge. Now, it's a little difficult to tell its scale here, but all the dotted lines on this map are the rail networks. And there is not a single road network, or rail network, excuse me, that goes from the Donbass in the east to the southern front at all. It all comes in via one link over the Kerch Bridge into Crimea and then north. If Kerch is destroyed, the Russians lose all rail support. And if they capture Kyrgyzstan, those green arrows, they're likely to get almost as many tanks as they did at Izmum, because the Russians can't take the tanks with them across the, board, the, the bridges. The bridges are too damaged. They have to get out and walk. If you do that, you leave roughly 2.5 million Russian citizens in Crimea and the vast bulk of the Russian military position in Ukraine without supply. And starvation of Ethiopian scale starts. That is how Ukraine wins. Balance of forces still favor the Russians here, strongly. But we're getting surprised over and over and over and over again. Which means that we shouldn't count on this being quick. We shouldn't count on this being decisive. And even if it is, that does mean the death of Russia as a state. So whether the Russians win and we're at the gates of Warsaw, or the Russians lose and we're looking at disintegration in Moscow, either way, we are in a very different economic world. Oh, yeah, okay. One more thing, well, no, like one of a thousand things. Uh, the first column, if you put Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus in kind of the same bucket, they collectively are the world's largest supplier of the first column. Number two for the second, third for the third. I'm gonna be speaking uh, at Langley next week, and they only wanna talk about this. We're gonna have four hours on just this. Holy crap, yeah, not intimidating at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna fly through a few that don't touch you guys directly uh, and some that do. But most of the energy stuff we're gonna treat separately. So first of all, nickel, copper, aluminum. 
can you do anything in the EV or the green tech or the electricity space without those? No. Okay. Lesson number one, the materials inputs that we need to do what you guys do are going to be in circumscribed supply moving forward. Building out new supplies of this on a global scale is a 25-year project. The world's number one wheat exporter has invaded the world's number five wheat exporter and is deliberately destroying any civilian infrastructure it comes across with a double emphasis on anything agricultural. Ukraine will cease being a uh, food exporter after the end of this year. We will never rebuild that. Here's my personal nightmare. Not only are these parts of the world important for food supply, they are the world's biggest suppliers of the materials that are necessary that we all use to make fertilizer. Specifically, Belarus and Russia are responsible for 40% of global potash. Hasn't been interrupted yet, but remember, this either ends in Warsaw or it ends in Moscow. You should count on all that going away. The increases that we've seen, the food inflation we've seen, this is before we actually have disruptions into the input flows. Now, we have been very fortunate in calendar year 2022. Mother Nature has given us great growing weather in most of the world. So we're not looking at food shortages this year, unless you happen to be a beneficiary of like the UN food program, which gets most of their grain from Ukraine. But the fertilizer flows have already been interrupted. This is a problem for next year. Neon, you guys all seen Star Wars, right? I mean, not, not like lightsabers, but uh, Reagan. So in 1983, Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik, Iceland, and they almost got rid of all nuclear weapons. Good summit. But at the last second, Gorbachev said to Ronnie, this is all dependent, of course, on Star Wars going away. Because if you've got a missile shield and none of us have weapons, that's just not fair. And Reagan's like, oh, well, this has been a fun meeting, and he left. Gorbachev went back to Moscow convinced that Star Wars and things like it were the future of great power competition. So he gave the orders to start building out the supply chains that would be necessary to build a constellation of giant space lasers. Neon is used to focus the apertures of the lasers. So the Soviet Union built out a neon supply system. The Soviet Union collapsed a few years later. They never got the satellites up, but the neon system was already there now. Well, neon is produced in a two-part process. Step one, you start with a steel foundry, which has something called an air separation unit, where they pull out the atmosphere and separate it into oxygen, nitrogen, and everything else. And you use the first two canisters to blow into the foundry system to get the right temperature gradient that you're after. That third canister is then sent to a more advanced separate facility where they separate out the argon and the helium and the neon. The first phase facilities are all in steel foundries in southern Russia, which are now shutting down because of sanctions. The second phase happens in two places, two. One is Odessa, which hasn't had electricity for four months, and the other one is in Mariupol, which has since been leveled. That is 80% of global neon, gone. Today, we don't use neon for space lasers. We use them for the lasers that etch semiconductors and we have lost 80% of global supply. Good thing green tech doesn't need semiconductors, right? It gets worse. Three types of semiconductors. The high end, the ones that you use to regulate power or put in cell phones or put in server farms, those are almost exclusively made in the United States, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. The middle range that go into automotive and aerospace, that's Thailand and Malaysia. The low end, the ones that make your, um, your singing light bulbs and your, your smart spatulas, those are all from China. The other 20% of global neon is exclusively from China. They get to decide who gets the neon to make chips. So if you need a singing margarita machine, you're in luck. If you need anything more sophisticated, well, the technical economic term for the situation we're finding ourselves in is. <laughs> and in case that wasn't enough, platinum group metals, palladium, platinum, rhodium. Russia's the number two supplier of all of them. It's the number one supplier of palladium, which is also used almost exclusively in high-end microchips. 
we are very close to start having to make decisions about what gets a chip and what doesn't. Okay, let's talk about the, the big issue economically globally, because the end of the semiconductor industry is actually pretty small fry compared to the rest of this. What we've got here is a pipe map. The green is oil, the red is natural gas. The areas that matter the most are these two ports. Primorsk up in the Baltic Sea and Novorossiysk down in the Black Sea. These two ports combined ship out typically about three million barrels per day of crude. They are two of the three largest offloading facilities the Russians have. The third one is out in the Far East. The Europeans and the Americans are bit by bit trying to chip away at the Russian energy sector without actually causing a global crash. That is a very difficult task. And the way they've decided to go about it is through insurance. And I know some of you are just like, just work with me here. If you don't have insurance on your vessel, you can't go into port or any place that might be congested like, say, Suez. So what they have done now is no Russian vessel can get commercial insurance. And as of January, no vessel of any type carrying any Russian crew cargo can get insurance. What the Chinese are doing to get around this at the moment is they've rented a half a dozen super tankers, taken them to the North Atlantic, put them off the coast of Portugal by about 1,000 miles, lashed them together into a raft, and they're bringing small shuttle tankers out from Pomorsk and Novorossiysk to the high seas where they're doing sea to sea transfers into larger ships that can make the trip all the way to China. Wildly dangerous. Also, wildly exposed because it's relying on every country that they sail by to not do anything. Now, so far, we haven't done anything because we don't want prices to explode. But it doesn't take much of an imagination to say, like, a storm hits the raft, we get an oil spill or some country that really doesn't care for the Russians, like Latvia, grabs it for like one of those shuttle tankers for like an OSHA regulation violation or something. One ship gets grabbed. One uninsured ship gets grabbed. And that's pretty much the last time that anyone docks at one of these two ports. That's three million barrels a day that goes offline almost immediately. But wait, there's more. Because this isn't Texas, this is Siberia. Siberia has permafrost, this frozen area, permanently subsoil. And for those of you who are from the north, you get it. In the winter, as long as you're moving, you're fine. But if you stop, you die. Same with oil. As long as it's flowing through the pipes, you're good. But if you stop, say three million barrels a day, stops at the ports, pressure builds up through the entire system, the oil stops flowing through the permafrost, it turns to gel on the pipe, the water by production freezes solid, and when water freezes, it expands. So you crack the well bore, the pipe, the valves, the pumps, everything. And you have to replace the whole thing, or at least repair it. The last time something like this happened in the Russian space, it was 1992, when the Cold War ended and the Soviet system collapsed. It took them 30 years to repair the damage. They only finished that in December. So we're looking at potentially five to six million barrels a day going offline in a very short period of time. All it's going to take is one storm or one Latvia. That's $300 oil. Easily $300 oil. Let's talk about where that moves things around. Now, on the right, you've got West Africa. The green arrows are all the crude that goes up to Europe. The yellow goes everywhere else. On the left, you have East Asia. That's where the crude oil goes to. The yellow coming from West Africa, the red from the Persian Gulf, the purple from North America, and the blue from the former Soviet space. Now, this is all data as of the first day of the war. Obviously, it's been disrupted since then. What has been going on is we're seeing a redistribution Normally, crude importers grab crude that is designed for their factories, their refineries, and crude that is relatively proximate. But 20 years of the Chinese rise means that the Chinese have gone out and grabbed crude from everywhere. They're not cost sensitive. They really don't care if it damages the refineries because they'll just rebuild them. And so they've built this spam of links. But the Europeans have more money. And now that the Europeans are scared, 
they have captured every drop of crude that the Chinese used to get from West Africa because they had to replace what they used to get from the former Soviet space. So the Chinese now, are their single largest supplier is from Russia, but not from Russia to Siberia to China. There's no infrastructure there, very little. They certainly can't surge through what they have. So they have to send stuff out through the west of Russia, by Europe, around Africa, and then up to the Chinese. It is now the world's longest supply run. Very vulnerable to any sort of disruption. Again, weather, Latvia, or in this case, South Africa, India. Plenty of ways that this can go horribly, horribly wrong very, very quickly. Which means that we've got a political decision that we're about to make in the United States. This is everybody's favorite energy secretary. Yeah. I mean, look at who's been energy sector secretary for the last 20 years. Guys, this could be a lot worse. Just, just recent history here, come on. Okay, Granholm is in the process of figuring out how to implement an oil export ban from the United States. Legally, there's no question. The presidency has the power. It has since 2015. It was part of a, an energy deal between Congress and the Obama administration to bring in a lot more green tech, increase the subsidies. Uh, they released the oil export ban at that point, but the president has the authority to reinstate it with an executive order. Doesn't need to consult Congress at all. Now, this is an oil export ban, just oil, not refined product, not natural gas, not electricity, just oil. Second, the president has the ability to offer endless numbers of national security waivers. So exports to, say, Canada and Mexico are likely to continue. And third, Granholm is not like her predecessors. She actually talks to industry. She actually like, seeks out conversations with industry. And so she knows if we just do a blanket ban, that wouldn't work. Their goal is to bring down fuel prices. But the US Gulf Coast is super saturated with crude. They export crude that meets the requirements of other markets, not necessarily our own. Whereas the Northeast, it's the opposite. Very little refining capacity. They have to import refined product from another country. So if you just do a blanket ban, you actually push prices down in Texas, but probably raise them in New York. And that is not what this administration is after. So they're trying to figure out how to make it work. I don't know what that's going to look like. But the point is they're willing to actually discuss this with you. You should take advantage of that. Because we all know what happens when an executive makes a decision without consultation. They always get it right every time. <laughs> but this is coming. Because if we have a breakdown in Russian flows and that price goes up to 100 to 200, there is no way a president as populist as Biden is not going to take sharp action to keep the American market super saturated and the rest of the world can hang. This needs to be done right. Which makes things even worse everywhere else. So same map, we're gonna look at natural gas now instead of oil, so the red lines. The one that matters right now is Nord Stream. It's a subsea line that goes from Russia proper under the Baltic, terminating in northern Germany. Until the war started, this was Russia's, excuse me, this was Germany's number one import source, responsible for almost a third of the natural gas that they use all by itself. At the moment, it's offline. The Russians were coy about it before, saying, oh, it's a compressor issue. Oh, there's been a coffee spill on the control panel. They, they literally spilled coffee on the control panel and took a photo of it, and that was the rationale for why the line was off. I mean, yeah, Russian propaganda is not what it used to be. <laughs> Anyway, they've become much more naked with their explanations of late, and now it's just that until the sanctions are gone and Germany leaves NATO, this stays off. Okay, you guys are in electricity, you get it. Marginal suppliers, marginal demand, that's what sets the price. Like if you take a, a gallon of gasoline to get to work, and you only get three quarters of a gallon, you'll pay anything you can for that last quarter, but it's not like it's just that last quarter that gets expensive, then it's the whole gallon. Marginal supplier, marginal demand. The Germans have lost their baseline supplier, and they're attempting to replace it with nine different marginal suppliers. And so prices have exploded, and they're going to stay up. Even worse, they're still getting some natural gas from Russia. Pipes that go through the war zones are now the reliable supplier. Oh my god! <laughs> so we're looking at the Germans losing even more, which means that 
natural gas prices and electricity prices in Germany are now at a point where there is not a single German economic entity that is any longer economically viable. Germany's already in recession. If you like VW, if you like Beamers, this is your last chance to get one. This is the end of German manufacturing within 12 months. That assumes that every molecule or electron they're trying to import from all those new marginal suppliers still makes it. It won't. This is now the best case scenario for the Germans. The Russians have said you have to choose between being Western or being modern. And the Germans, at the moment, are choosing to be Western. Honestly, I didn't think it would be this clean cut of a choice for them. But then again, we're also not to winter yet. Okay, let's, um, let's roll some grenades into the next panel. <laughs> solar intensity, the red are zones with today's technology where solar power makes sense economically and environmentally. If you move from the red into the orange, the intensity is not so good. It still makes environmental sense, but economically it's probably a wash. By the time you move to green, solar intensity is so low that you will never generate enough electricity to pay down the carbon debt of building the panels in the first place. You put up panels in mass in green, you have increased your carbon footprint. You've done the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Every dot on the map is a population center of at least a million people. And if you go beyond those red lines, you're getting into areas where the seasonal extremities for solar are so much that you really it's only useful for three or four months of the year. Three or four months of the year where you usually don't need it for heating or cooling. Okay. Same thing wind. Red good, green bad. All right, now I'm going to combine these. I'm going to show you where it's good for both. So the blue, good for wind. The green, good for solar. The dark green, good for both. We have already eliminated where over 80% of the world's population lives. But we're not done. You don't put up solar panels over a cornfield because they need the sun there. You don't put up wind turbines above 10,000 feet because the air density is so low you can't turn the blades. And you don't put a lot of generation more than 1,000 miles from a population center because you'll lose so much from transmission loss. You factor all that out, this is all that's left. Now, does this mean that green tech is pointless? Not quite what I'm trying to say. I've got solar panels on my house, but I live at 7,500 feet in Colorado. There's nothing between me and the sun. It works great. Is Excel here today? Yeah, these guys are smug as <laughs> <laughs> They're in the wind zone of the Great Plains. They've got low population density. Whew, they're going to hit 100%. And they're not going to have to sweat all that much to do it. But everyone else, oh. <laughs> Geography matters, folks. Which means there's a tale of two environmental policies that are going on right now. And the story of how that is resolved is going to determine ESG. So on the one hand, you've got California, which when it comes to regulation, wow. And on the other hand, you've got Germany, which is basically California regulation, but with Better type font, it's a little bit better organized, a little bit pl better planned out, but more or less the same thing. And what we're seeing in Germany now is an abject failure of the energy vinda that they have planned for the last 20 years. But the same policies in California, while they are generating hiccups and heartburn, we've had a few brownouts and evolution. And at least for now, it's kind of working. Can it be better? Yes, it can be better. It's still California, it's still regulation. I don't want to oversell this point. But we have basically the same policy set in two different economies, one of which where the transition haltingly is moving forward, and the other one where we are looking at deindustrialization because of it. Geography matters. And the difference is very simple. California is sunny. And the Germans don't know what sun is. Within the environmental community, this hasn't really sunk in yet. 
the idea that you have to tailor your ESG programs and your green tech and your transition programs to what actually happens where you live. There's this idea, especially with solar that's been fetishized, the idea is you just put up more of it and you're good. The idea that Germany has probably increased its carbon footprint because of the energy vendor, that hasn't sucked in yet. But I have a feeling that once people are clustering around these warming sensors that they're when warming centers that they're building in Germany right now, so you can leave your house because your power bill is now more than your mortgage, and you can go to a community center to get warm, and by the way, your manufacturing job is gone, it's going to sink in that we have to change our policies based on where we live. And that with the technology we have today, most of this doesn't work for most of us. Solar in New York is maybe the dumbest thing I've heard, aside from maybe solar in Germany. Same in Toronto. The hilarious thing about all of this, of course, is that in the United States, our sunnier and our windier places are usually red states. And our places that really, really like green tech are usually urban areas in the Northeast. It's just completely ass backwards. The first metro region in the United States that is likely to go 100% green isn't in California, it's in Texas. It's probably Dallas-Fort Worth. There are no environmentalists in Dallas-Fort Worth. <laughs> but the technology today makes sense there. It's in the edge of the solar zone, it's in the heart of the wind zone, it's perfect. Omaha's probably second, Denver's probably third. But you're never gonna do this in megalopolis. Until we find a way to marry these disparate facts together, we're going to be spinning our wheels. And that's the good news. Building out green tech is an order of more difficulty and complication than building out conventional stuff. So here we've got the material components that go into electric vehicles versus conventional. More materials, which means more sourcing, which means more complex supply chains. Obviously, if you can source the power on the back end, that's the big attraction. But you still have to build the thing in the first place. Here's the same basic data, but now looking at power generation with your green tech at the bottom and your conventional, I'm sorry, your green tech at the top and your conventional at the bottom. These are the four we rely on the Russians for. Do you really think we can do a broad scale energy transition with significantly less copper? Do we even think that's theoretically possible? We can't have globally available quantities of fossil fuels at affordable rates without the Russians. And there's no way in hell we can do the green transition without them. We need a series of technological breakthroughs in material science before we even consider this at scale. But what's really hilarious is if we start breaking up the world into trading zones based on geography, which is where we're going, the Western Hemisphere looks pretty good. And the Eastern Hemisphere is totally screwed. Germany, California. Now, one more thing about California. And again, don't overplay this one. California does not get enough credit for being able to move the goalposts. And I realize that moving the goalposts when it comes to regulation is frustrating. But they set a goal. They know the technology doesn't exist to do it yet. And if they get closer to the deadline, and the technology is not manifested, they move the goalposts. I call that intelligent regulation. They're not doing that in Germany. <laughs> oh my God, no. Okay. Uh, you guys, you stealing a few things? Yeah, okay. Let's talk about another way we're all screwed. Most countries in the world treat steel as a national security issue. So you either mine the iron or yourself or you import it from a third country. You throw it into a blast furnace, usually powered by coal, that gets you an intermediate product called pig iron. You then process that further to either make relatively low quality hot rolled steel or relatively high quality cold rolled steel. We use hot rolled in places where you don't see it. I-beams in buildings, car frames, uh, the rebar that goes into highways. You use cold rolled anywhere we're actually going to see it. In your electronics, in your veneers, in your claddings. The United States is different from most countries in that we don't follow this pattern. We are very agnostic, not just about where we get our energy, but where we get our raw materials and our intermediate inputs. 
So we do very little importing of raw iron ore. We do very little blast furnace work ourselves. We import that semi-finished pig iron from other places. And then we process that mostly into cold rolled. So if you're doing construction, you're probably importing the steel to do it. And if you're doing the high end, you're certainly importing the raw materials that are necessary to do it. Here's the problem. Three quarters of the world's pig iron that is internationally traded comes from Ukraine and Russia. The Russian stuff is mostly offline right now because of the sanctions. And the part of Ukraine that does steel is around that nuclear power plant that the Russians took over, and that's where they get the electricity to run their furnaces. The coal that they would use comes from the Donbass, so they're just shut down. We get two-thirds of our pig iron from those two countries, and it's gone to zero. So even if the technology was perfect, even if there were no other input supply problems, steel is a big issue. All right, let's talk about a couple minor things before we get to the big stuff. <laughs> the cult of personality around Chairman Xi has become so all-encompassing that he is now the most isolated leader in world history, more than the emperors of old, more than Mao, more than the Kim dynasty in North Korea. He has shot the messenger, literally, so many times that no one wants to bring him any information at all because they don't know what's going to set him off. It's just him and the voices in his head. He has become everything that Donald Trump always wanted to be. There's abject alteration and no challenges. And that is a disaster for governance because he doesn't find out about things. Uh, some great examples. Uh, last May, when the power outages started and they had rolling blackouts across the country, he probably didn't find out until September. No one wanted to tell him. The week before the Ukraine war started, started, Putin told him to his face that he wasn't planning on attacking. And all the guys in the back of the room were like, because they didn't dare challenge him. And so Xi was the most surprised world leader when he found out that the tanks had rolled. And of course, the issue of the day is COVID, the lockdowns. Now, um, a lot of us work in rural areas, right? That, that's safe. Uh, let's just say that we've all been exposed to a variety of opinions when it comes to COVID. The two that dominate are, you know, vaccines are good, everyone get vaccinated. Natural immunity is good, everybody catch COVID. And I think if we're all being honest with ourselves at home when the doors are locked in the dark, we'll admit that the other side has some relevant points that are worth exploring. They can't do that in China. China has successfully kept COVID out of the general population. No one has natural immunity but China's vaccines don't work. So no one has vaccinated immunity either. If they were to open up, you'd be looking at two to five million deaths a month for a minimum of six months. And in a one man state, that is a regime changing event. So lockdowns, they might get a little bit smarter, but lockdowns forever. We also have a problem with their food system. There's something called African swine fever that has become endemic in the Chinese pork industry. It's basically Ebola for pigs. And the Chinese three years ago had to cull more of their herd than the rest of the world's commercial herds have pigs. Since then, they say they've had not a single case, but if you look at a heat map of where ASF is in East Asia, all of Chinese borders are on fire, and then China is this big empty zone. Because in China, you don't have an African swine fever case unless the government says you have one. So they've had zero. They probably have a raging pandemic right now. Well, if you can't guarantee pork, and pork is more important for them than all animal proteins are for the West combined, all that's left is rice. Rice is the most phosphate fertilizer hungry crop we grow. The Chinese used to be the world's largest producer and exporter of the stuff. As a result, they've stopped all exports. So we've lost potash because of the Ukraine war and we've lost phosphate because of Chinese mismanagement. Bottom line of all of this is the best case scenario for China is increasing instability in their political, economic, and manufacturing systems moving forward. I don't think we're gonna see the, the short-term complete collapse that we're gonna see in Germany, but they are no longer a reliable partner. And you have to factor that into everything that you do, especially if you're buying solar panels that are made by slave labor in Zhejiang. 
because we are very close getting to the point where two goals of ESG are diametrically opposed, and I think I know which one's going to win. Slave labor, bad. Bad. Okay, uh, transport. This is the USS Ford. It is the most piece of military equipment humans have ever built. One of them, by itself, can take on any but the seven largest air forces in the world. That assumes that the US Navy fights fair, which it doesn't, because that's the whole idea of the Navy. The ships move. You choose the time and the place of the conflict. You take that into account, one Ford can take out but any but three of the world's largest air forces, one of which is ours. We're building four of them to complement our pre-existing 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers. You want to bring the hammer down on the country, this is the right tool for the job. You want to patrol the global ocean so that global commerce can go anywhere unmolested, this is a horrible choice. Because if you only have 14 carriers, seven of them are in port in every, at any given time, that's not enough to patrol the global oceans. That's not enough by a factor of 10. Instead, you need these bad boys, destroyers. Hundreds of them, specifically 800. We have 70, half of which are assigned to defend the carriers. Even if we wanted to still be the world's policemen, we no longer have the capacity to even try. And there's no coalition of countries around the world that can either. People like to say, yes, the Chinese, though, have twice as many ships as we do. Yeah, but half of them would fit on this stage. They're itty bitty. They can't sail more than 1,000 miles from home. They can't patrol sea lanes, especially not for a globe-spanning corporate hunger that is the Chinese system. Anything that is dependent on transoceanic trade is vulnerable now. And since there's a war on, and since there's mismanagement in China, you should not count on those supply lines continuing. It's worse for some, population density. If you're in the top left, bottom left, bottom right, those three quadrants are net exporters of raw materials, of food, and of energy. The top right one is the only one that's a net importer. In fact, the net importer is just this circle. Anyone notice a country in there that we've had some concerns about? China is the country most dependent on a peaceful, globalized trading system that can no longer be maintained. So whether it's because of the Russian war, COVID, a food crisis, a trade dispute, or the inevitable end of global trading access, this story stops. And that's not even the top reason we should expect it to stop. I've got that coming up soon. All right, back to energy. This is total investment from all sources, all corporate, all government, into all oil and all natural gas globally. Back in 2014, a story started circulating in Wall Street, in Paris, in Japan, that fossil fuels are done. You've heard this story. I think that's what the next panel is going to talk about. No pressure. If we're going to be done with fossil fuels between 2030 and 2040, if that's where we're headed, and it takes three to eight years to even get first output from a conventional oil and natural gas field, and then another five to 15 years to break even, why would you pour your money into that? Now, there are a series of logical flaws with that freight train argument, but it took hold, and investment into the space plummeted by two thirds over the next seven years. Three to eight years to bring a project online. So if we double or triple investment in the space today, you should not expect a supply effect to hit the markets before 2025. So where we are right now, 2025, that's as good as it gets. Okay. Now what is true for the global average is not true for each individual piece. I love this graphic sequence. I like to call this the checkbook map because every dot is someone who has paid their power bill. You guys love the checkbooks, right? Yeah. Here are the world's conventional and oil, ba oil and natural gas basins. A lot of the anger and angst and stress of the last 75 years is about, about getting the energy from where it's produced to where people actually live and consume it. I'm going to give you another click and show you where the world's commercially viable shale deposits are. Watch North America. And 
And some of those lighter ones are just ones that haven't had the exploration work, so we just don't know yet. There used to be a lot more pink on this graphic, but in 10 years, lots of people have poked at their shale and discovered it's just not all that, except here. There are a dozen reasons why U.S. shale is fundamentally different from global energy. At least at this moment, this is the most important one. We produce it where we live, and no one else can. So even if the Biden administration botches this oil export ban, we're working from such a strong baseline, there'll be lots of fallout, but most of it will be on other continents. Checkbook map, zoomed in. Here is the most important concentration of checkbooks in human history. It's Marshalltown, Iowa. This is where I am from. <laughs> Bismarck, North Dakota, should you find yourself in Bismarck and you need a good meal, you're in the wrong city. <laughs> and this is not a frat party. Western North Dakota, population eight, nine, <laughs> ten, ten, okay. It's not lit up because everybody's afraid of the dark. It's lit up because of a problem with transport. Oil is a liquid, it conforms to the shape of the container. You can put in a rail car or a tanker truck or whatever but natural gas disperses. And so much is bubbling up as a byproduct from the shale oil fields that they have to flare it until they can build out the infrastructure to gather it. That takes three to 15 months based on where you are. You can see the flares from space. You'll see the same thing in the Permian and the same thing in the Eagleford. Now in the United States, we have the world's largest and most diversified natural gas system, but we still can't keep up, which means that for the last 15 odd years, natural gas has been unique in the American economic experience. It's been a waste product. It's sold for below the cost of production. In many cases, negative prices. And we've all gotten used to that. And it's been brilliant. But you play that forward and we use more of it because we all love things that are free. This is where we source our electricity. That light blue wedge is natural gas. And when US shale became a big thing, Around the mid-2000s, you can see we just exploded in our demand. We've expanded that demand by 50% in 12 years. All the free stuff we have found long-term uses for. And the party's over. Here's pricing, Henry Hub. Everyone on the Gulf Coast, of course, knows what these are, hurricanes. Storm comes through, you have to shut down production. Storm goes by, you send your crews back out, you spend months repairing the damage until you get it all back online. But by 2009, shale production was providing the majority of our natural gas and every single shale well is on shore. We don't care about the storms from an energy point of view any longer, at least not from a natural gas point of view. And there's that long stretch of two to three dollar gas that we all thought was beautiful. Texans, of course, know what this spike is. That's last January when Texas got cold. It got down to 27. <laughs> oh. And this is what we're all talking about right now. Nine-ish. Now, we have only now gotten back to the 50-year average for natural gas prices in the United States. And we're like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. You guys want to see what the Europeans and the Asians are talking about? Yeah. They've lost their baseload supplier. They're replacing it with marginal suppliers. This does not yet represent shortages. That's coming. Almost all metals processing and fertilizer fabrication in Europe has shut down at this point. Industry will shut down for the rest over the next six months probably. Natural gas is the primary input into nitrogen-based fertilizers. Europeans used to be the world's largest suppliers. They've just disappeared from the market completely. We have lost access to all three fertilizer types globally. Now, in the United States, we get our potash from Canada. I don't have a lot of good things to say about Canada, but I'll say that. We are the world's largest supplier. <laughs> I was there for two weeks. <laughs> they kicked me out. Um, Natural gas, we're the world's largest supplier, and even with at, at nine, we're the world's lowest cost producer. 
So we're fine on nitrogen. And phosphate, we primarily source within North America and we get the balance from like Morocco and Israel countries that I think are gonna be broadly okay. We're okay here. Most of the rest of the world is not. Now, the question is where's our new price band? If it's not gonna be between two or three, is nine our new normal? Is it going higher? I think neither. Here's where we get our shale gas. Now those bottom two, the blue and the orange, that's the Marcellus and the Utica. Those are plays that we go after specifically for the gas because it's situated between Chicago and New York City. And so they don't have too far to send it. Natural gas is what they need. That's what they produce on purpose. The next three are the Permian, the Eagleford, and the Bakken. Places where we're primarily after the oil. But I mean, check out the gray, that's the Permian. See how much that's expanded? And no one's drilling there for gas on purpose. That's byproduct. Everything above this arrow though, are shale plays from the original phase. I mean, I'm, go get in your way back machine and go back to like 2005 when shale was a gas thing, not an oil thing. Those are the fields that broke the revolution. But then we figured out how to transfer the technologies to go after liquids as opposed to gases. And we now have the shale revolution in its current form. What started last November is the shale guys are going back to the fields where it all started, places that haven't had a lot of attention in 10 years. Because when natural gas is at two, no one's going after natural gas on purpose. But at nine, they will. And we're now taking the oil technologies and back applying them to gas. And you should expect everything in that top third to explode. In fact, it's already increasing pretty dramatically. But it takes a little time. One more reason why the US shale is different. It's not three to eight years to bring it online. It's three to eight weeks. Or that's what it was back in 2019 before we had the everything in shortage economy. Workers, pipe, pumps. Now it's more like three to eight months. It's been eight months since November, and we're seeing output surge. But the Ukraine war is taking stuff offline faster than we can bring stuff online. Another reason to expect the Biden administration to move on export bans. All right, um, just because I haven't given you quite enough things to be worried about. As you get older, your net worth increases. Especially once you hit your 50s, your kids are moving out, the house is paid down. But if you're not raising kids and your house is paid for, your expenses have dropped. But you've been at your job for 30 years, your income's high. That split generates net, uh, net wealth. And we are our richest in the last 10 years before we retire. At that point, you liquidate your stocks and your bonds and you go into T-bills and cash. Because if there is a market or a currency crash, you will never be able to recover. So you have more and more money as you age until you're 65 and then it goes away. Normally, this hasn't really mattered. Because normally, this is what our demographic profiles have looked like. It's a standard pyramid. Children at the top, retire, I'm sorry, children at the bottom, retirees at the top, everyone else stacked up in between. And normally, the thin slice of 65 year olds that retire, one, it's not a very big chunk of the population, so it's not a big deal. And two, there are more 64 year olds below that and 63 year olds below that and so on. And it's the same percentage every year that step back. So it doesn't really move things for society at, at large. But starting in the late 1940s, the Americans made globalization possible, which meant instead of you in your own economy having to generate the steel and the computers and the aluminum and the food and the energy all by yourself, you could focus on the things you did well and sell them abroad at a premium and then import the other stuff that you didn't have. Everyone could play. And as we all specialized, our incomes went up and we all moved into cities to take the manufacturing and the services jobs. When you live on the farm, you live differently. Kids are free labor, you have a whole bunch of them. When you move into the city, kids are really expensive, questionable habits. <laughs> and adults aren't dumb. So we've gone in this country in the last century and a half from having seven kids on average to 2.2, right? Here's where we are now because of that change in behavior. The baby boomers, the largest generation we have ever had, is on the verge of retirement. In fact, on average, our baby boomers retire in the fourth 
quarter of this year. Which means, for the last couple of years, we see this ever-increasing pace of transfer of assets from those stocks and bonds into those T-bills and cash. And the result is much higher capital costs. We know that from January of last year to December of next year, capital costs have to increase by at least a factor of five because of a lack of supply. That's independent of anything the Fed does. The fact that the Fed is trying to deal with an inflation explosion at the same time, which might generate an economic turning, that's just bad luck and bad timing. So 5x increase in prices for capital, assuming the Fed stops right now, assuming the war stops right now. We know that there's a lot of ESG programs out there for green tech, that if you raise the cost of capital by 100 or 500 basis points, they don't work anymore. Start thinking of 1,000 basis points. We're going to be there in less than two years. That's the capital side. There's also a labor question. The boomers are the largest generation we've ever had. Half of them will be retired by the end of this year. They are being replaced by a smaller generation. We've always known this was going to happen. We've known this was going to happen since the last of the Gen Xers were born in 1980. Are you ready? It's not going to work. This is a structural issue. This isn't people quietly quitting. This isn't COVID, although COVID did speed a few things up. This is demographic. If you want more workers who are 40, you needed to start 41 years ago. <laughs> That's just how it works. I'm not going to draw a picture for you. Okay, next generation down, Gen X. This is my generation. We are part of the second smallest generation in American history. And when we look at the boomers, I mean, mostly we're just filled with disgust. But uh, <laughs> we have learned from them, even if it's just learned what not to do. When the boomers entered the market back in the 80s, there were so many of them that they pushed down the cost of labor because they competed each other for wages. That forced most families to put a second worker into the workforce. Two income families. That generated the pressure that gave the boomers the highest divorce rate in history. Gen X looks at that and is like, wow, we're not doing that. For us, our families and our time are at least as important as our money. So we are far more likely to be single income households, and we have a much higher marriage preservation rate than the boomers as a result. There are downsides to that. When you've got 800 gajillion boomers and like 112 Xers, and the Xers are the low men on the totem pole, you get the lowest wage increases in American history. Until now. Because <laughs> now all the boomers are going away. And even if all Xers wanted to work, and we do not, <laughs> there would never be enough of us to fill all those shoes. So we are now seeing the highest increases in compensation in American history. And it's going to run for at least another 10 years. So for us, we are finally having our day. <laughs> the rest of you know this is labor inflation, and you can suck it. <laughs> Zoomers, new kids on the block, born since 2000. They are the youngest generation. They are also the smallest generation. And they are not millennials. Now, millennials have a number of characteristics that are accurate and backed up by the data. Collegiate, cooperative, work well in groups, touchy-feely management skills, their forte, absolutely, strongly supported by the data. That's not the Zoomers. See, the millennials were raised by the boomers. They were told they were special. Whatever. <laughs> Zoomers were raised by Gen X. We, were, we never told them they were special. We told them they were behind that they could never trust anyone, that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid weren't going to be there for us. So of course, they're not going to be there for you. You're on your own. You trust no one. You have to be better. Not better than the millennials. That's easy. No, no, no. Better than everyone. They're overachievers. But they're loners. And they have the highest suicide rate in American history. It's probably because we told them that when they turn 17 and a half, they have to get the hell out of our house. Their dream job is to work in a locked closet coding in the dark. They're very loyal workers, but they never want to meet you. 
And if you need software work, this is great. We've got a whole generation custom built for it. But if you need somebody out on a line, oh my God, no. They are the most stilted workforce we were ever going to have. And we know exactly how many we have. We know exactly what the flow into the workforce for the next 20 years is going to be. They're already here. Just like we know exactly what the outflow because of the boomer retirement is going to be. This calendar year, that's a shortage of 400,000 workers a year. That will probably peak around 2032 at somewhere between 900,000 and 1.2 million shortage. That's our labor environment. We know exactly what it's going to look like for the next decade. Final generation, the millennials. Um, we've talked about some of the positive aspects, so it's only fair to talk about some of the negative. Lazy, entitled, show up for work at the crack of 1 p.m. <laughs> Data also supports that for half of them. The other half have always done everything we've always expected of them, demanded of them. They graduated from college in three and a half years. They didn't go to Europe to find themselves for a decade. They went straight into the workforce. And because of it, they got screwed. When the financial crisis hit in 08, they were the last ones in the door. They were the first ones kicked out. So whether it's because the millennials did everything right or everything wrong, they missed out on three to five years of core formative work experience in their 20s, and they will never get that back. They are the least skilled worker demographic we have ever had for their age group. And they will be until the day they retire. The hope for the labor market to get back to where we were in 2019 still lies with millennials. Indirectly, it lies with their kids. A large generation generates a large generation. All we have to do for the labor market to fix itself is wait for the millennials to have their kids, for them to grow up, get trained, and then enter the workforce, which will first happen in large number in the year 2042. It's not often that you get an economist telling you exactly what's going to go down for 20 years. Run with it. Don't wait three months or six months or nine months or 90 months if you need to hire. It will not get better than it is now. And as awful as that sounds, oh, it is so much better than everywhere else. Here are the big four economies. The blue arrows are the American millennial cadre. You'll notice that in Germany and Japan, they don't even, they don't have it. It just drops off to oblivion. Both of those countries will cease to exist as meaningful economic, activity, economic, eh, economic entities in the first half of this century. We've always known that the German manufacturing model was going to collapse this decade. The energy issue is just bringing the date forward. Do you need German equipment? Buy it now, but don't count it on actually arriving. They probably don't have enough time left for that. Top right, there's China. Now, it looks like opposite that blue arrow for the millennials, you've got that spike in the Chinese demographics, and that's 120, 130 million people. That's a lot. Or is it? Now, this was already the world's fastest aging workforce before COVID. In the last two years, the Chinese have started to update their demographic data, and they're now admitting publicly that they have overcounted their population by at least 100 million people all of whom would have been born since the one-child policy was adopted 40 years ago. So people 40 and under. If that is true, those yellow bars don't exist. And I would add that they're saying a minimum of 100 million overcount. It could be significantly worse. We just don't know. The Chinese economic model also ends this decade. Now, they'll probably last a little bit longer than the Germans will. But I would not plant, make a lot of long-term orders for Chinese gear, unless you just like you know, Reno or something, in which case, go for it. Uh, we need to figure out how to get by without either the Germans or the Chinese. And that basically means doubling the size of the industrial plant in the United States as quickly as is feasibly possible in an era of constrained capital and labor. Inflation, inflation, inflation. There's a partial patch south of the border. Uh, our Mexican partners have the healthiest demography, not just in the rich world, but in the advanced developing world as well. But I will point out, because this is a group that deals with electricity, and I, I know you import a lot of Mexicans for this, check out how it drops. 
This is when NAFTA was ratified 30 years ago, and then it just dropped straight down. They started the same industrialization, urbanization trend of the rest of the world just later. Now, this is not a terminal demography by any stretch of the imagination, but it does mean we need to start thinking of Mexicans in a way that we're not used to in this country. They're a precious resource, limited in supply. Net migration from Mexico to the US has now been negative for 12 of the last 13 years. It'll probably never be positive again. And we're not the only ones who need to double the size of our industrial plant. Mexicans are taking Mexican jobs in Mexico because they can. We're kind of in a box, just like everybody else. It's still great from a manufacturing point of view, though. Here are labor costs in Southeast Asia. Here are our Mexican neighbors, hyper-competitive. And here are the Chinese. Mexican labor is now one-third the cost of Chinese labor and more highly skilled. That's a delta that's never going to close. All right, final slide. Let me give you the nut. Here's inflation in the United States and Canada. Brother economies, very similar. Our numbers track as you would expect. Three big phases for inflation in the post-World War II era. First, the original globalization push, the original industrialization push. We run power lines in the countryside. We build skyscrapers. We build interstate highways. Industrial demand-driven inflation. You only have to do that once, luckily. Second, the baby boomers come of age. They move into the suburbs. They have kids. They buy cars and homes. Consumer demand-driven inflation. And then we got this weird period that we all think of as normal. The Chinese entered the global economy, dumped a billion workers onto the workforce. Manufactured good prices go into a sharp deflationary spiral. The Russian system collapses, the Soviet system collapses. And an empire worth of raw materials is dumped onto global markets, keeping commodity prices under control. All the inflationary trends of the last 75 years are back. And all of the disinflationary ones have flipped. We need to double the size of our industrial plant. It's going to look just like the 50s. The baby boomers may be retiring, but the millennials are at their peak of consumption and will be for another decade. That's a repeat of the 80s. Russian materials are going away. Chinese labor is going away. We are looking at 9 to 15% inflation per year for a minimum of the next five until such time as we double our industrial plant and we've rebuilt, rebuilt our manufacturing supply chains closer to home in a more sustainable, lower cost manner. If we do that, then at some point in 2027, 2028, we exit this inflationary period and we have a much more stable price structure going forward. If we fail to double the size of the industrial plant, that nine to 15% range sticks and we have product shortages of every type. So, the question is, where are you guys gonna buy your crap from? <laughs> because if you're gonna bet on the Chinese and the Germans, this is our new normal. But it doesn't have to be. Oh, I forgot one more thing. I promised you pricing data for natural gas. With the new stuff that is coming online in places like the Haynesville and the Fayetteville, we're probably going to have a functional floor, four and a half, and a functional ceiling, about seven, seven and a half. I think that's where this is going to ultimately equal out. Whether you find that you know, delightful or horrific is, of course, up to you. All right. Uh, if you're looking for something to throw at your neighbor, there are the books. Uh, the QR code goes to a charity that I'm currently sponsoring called MedShare. They deal with uh, medical assistance in Ukraine right up to the front line. Keep in mind that even if all of our hopes for the Ukrainians come true and they can pull off another 25, 30 Kharkiv counteroffensives, that's still a lot of work. Uh, they can use all the help they can get. So MedShare I like because they take donated medical equipment from around the world and all of your money just goes to transporting it to Ukraine. Okay, that's it for me. I have, there's no timer up here. Am I like way over? Am I under? We've got time for questions. Yeah, yeah. Great, okay. I know there's an app for those of you who are shy, but also I have eyes and you know we have microphones. Yeah, so reminder on the app, it's a good place to type your questions and especially if you're trying to remember them during any of the panel sessions. Uh, so James, how many minutes do you want for Q&A? Yeah, 15. 15 minutes, all right. Megan, you wanna kick us off with a question? 
Yeah, okay, and, and maybe quick throw back that QR code from the very beginning in case people did forget um, that shows the, perfect, thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you, amazing presentation. I think all of us were, there was a lot of, uh, oh my goodness, and uh, so at the end of that, uh, I feel like the attendees in this room represent a lot of kind of regulatory or legislative voice, if you will, um, and so based on everything that you've talked about this morning, what should our collective message be regarding the oil export ban? <laughs> uh, there's not going to be a collective message because it, it's different based on where you are. Um, let me give you an example. So the refining industry is absolutely losing their minds over this because they were designed to run on heavy, sour crude that was imported primarily from Canada until recently Venezuela. So they take the low end crude from the rest of the world, they bring it into their high end refineries, they turn it into finished product and then sell that at top dollar globally. That probably won't work for them in an oil export ban environment. They're gonna be swamped with light sweep that's produced from the shale fields. So they're gonna to have to basically add two, three million barrels of new refining capacity very, very quickly. But once that's done, they will have their old and they will have their new and they will be able to do both business lines and they will be the fastest growing sector in the world. So they're gonna early and celebrate later. <laughs> Everyone has to go through that thought process. So if you happen to be in Arizona, it's difficult for you to get natural gas. It's difficult for you to get oil. You will probably be one of the places that sees higher petroleum costs, but you're also in Sun Central. So the balance of costs for energy, for natural gas versus oil versus refined product versus green tech, the balances we've all planned on, those are going to change, but that it's going to change differently in every part of the country. All right, uh, another one here, great discussion, but this view seems to assume some level of static currency markets. Can you comment on deeper implications for currency markets and their impact on geopolitical strategy? Sure, um, that's the best way to phrase this one. There was a bit of a, um, a reckoning in Japan and in Europe when the Russians moved into Ukraine. And they realized that even if the Americans do continue to hold up the ceiling for everyone from a security point of view, that the game really is on and things need to be done differently. Which means that they looked at their demographics and they looked at their trade balance and they all came to the same conclusion that without the United States as part of the game, dominant part of the game, their economies don't function. And so they basically subsort, sub, what's the word I'm looking for? subsumed their currency policies into the US dollar, and they're now basically adjuncts of the US dollar system. Canada was already there, Mexico was already there, the Australians and the Kiwis were already there. And now all the hard currencies of the world are basically following the Fed when it comes to currency policy, which means that the US dollar has nowhere to go but up for at least the next 30 years. It won't necessarily go up in a straight line, uh, but even the Chinese, who are always concerned about whatever the Americans are gonna do and the power that gives them, they still use SWIFT. Their Chinese system for payment rationale uses SWIFT. Uh, and when the Russians decided to switch a lot of stuff over to Yuan to stick it to the US, they discovered there's no liquidity in that market. And so all that money is gone. It's in Yuan that they can't use. So everyone has kind of done what they always do. Like, oh, anything but the dollar. And they get to something that's not the dollar. Like, holy crap, this is useless. And they go back to the dollar. And since we've got demographic collapse in Japan and Europe, the long-term trend is for a weaker yen and a weaker euro for decades to come. All right, so it sounds like it's gonna be difficult to purchase from Germany and China um, during this increase in US industrial um, time period, so. Who should we be purchasing from? Oh, you need to build out the supply chains. I'm sorry if that wasn't direct enough. Um, Mexico is the logical partner. Where are my Texans again? Talk to your Texans people. <laughs> Texans know how to interface with Mexicans beautifully. It's a great relationship. The downside is that there's only 130 million Mexicans. And that makes it sound like there's actually more than there are, because only a quarter of the Mexican population is in the northern Mexican states that the Texans have the most experience with a lot of that labor has already been spoken for. So if you're not part of the first wave of relocation, you're then gonna to have to go down to central Mexico. Not that that's bad, but it's a different way of operating and you're not gonna have an American guide to it. It's much more clickish than what you get in northern Mexico. So the Texans, whether they saw this coming or not is irrelevant. They've, they're already two feet in Mexico. 
Automotive is two feet in Mexico. Aerospace is two feet in Mexico. We're now getting to that more middle manufacturing that touches your guys' space, but there is not enough labor in northern Mexico to do it all. And when it becomes apparent that electronics out of East Asia are in danger, oh my God, everyone is gonna be running for Mexico as soon as they can, and there just isn't enough labor for everyone. So go first, go big, go early. So this one uh, may be interesting. How does this play out in the midterm elections? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Americans are so fickle and the polls have been flipping wildly over the course of the next couple of last couple of months. I really don't know how that is gonna shake out. Uh, the two issues that seem to be generating the most oomph are inflation at the moment seems to be trending down. I don't expect that to stick, but it might stick long enough to give the Democrats a boost in November. And everything that's going on with Trump is making him look more and more deranged by the day. Uh, it doesn't matter if his supporters turn on him. It matters what the independents do. And the independents already had a really bad taste in their mouth from the last five years. Uh, and everything that Trump is doing now is just turning them off. So. If these trends do continue, the Democrats are certainly going to hold on to uh, the Senate, and they'll probably hang on to the House, too. Probably. Okay. Again, Americans are fickle. Americans are fickle, yes. Is there an opportunity for the U.S. to address the demographic situation with sure. a more open immigration policy? Yeah, so there's two ways you fix demographics. Uh, the first is, I mean, I guess the technical term is pro-natalist policies. You make it easier for people to have and raise kids. That is ultimately a cost of living issue. So we still have the cheapest electricity, land, and food prices in the world heavily regionalized. Texas looks great. Midwest looks pretty good. Northeast, oh my God, no. And that's reflected in the demographic patterns going back 60 years. The second option is immigration. Here's the problem. The world's running out of Mexicans. That's been our number one source for 30 years. Uh, you then have Central America, and you know people are stressed out about the convoys coming north, but remember, the Mexican demographics comes down to 30-year-olds and goes straight down. The Central American one comes down to 25 year olds and goes straight down. This is not for the long term. And in a few years, that's gonna stop because there just aren't enough Central Americans. That's all the people who can walk here. Everyone else has to fly. That means they come when they're a little older, maybe a little wealthier, and it's more like a Canadian inflow. But that means that the United States has to go out to the Eastern Hemisphere and do something we haven't done in over a century. Recruit. I would put forward that politically in this country, both on the left and the right, we are not ready for that step at the moment. We'll get there. Our view on immigration ebbs and flows. Right now we've ebbed pretty hard. We'll get back, but I doubt it's gonna happen in the next five years. Uh, because I think there's a recognition in the economy now that the primary input into all these inflationary things we're seeing is labor. But we haven't mentally connected that to immigration as a solution, and the scale of what we would need to do is pretty big. You're talking about bringing in a couple million people a year for at least a decade. We've done that in the past easily, but I don't think we're there right now. So you mentioned Canada a couple times. Where do you see hydroelectric and nuclear playing in a pan-Canadian grid and increased inner ties to the U.S.? <sighs> I, just like the California-Germany juxtaposition, we've got the same thing going on in Canada. Uh, green tech in its current form in Ontario is an utter disaster. But Quebec and BC have brilliant hydro. So they've got a way of making it work with the exact same policy set that won't work in Ontario. Uh, if the goal is a higher and higher, higher percentage of green energy, I would expect us to see less and less and less electricity flows from BC and Quebec South. Uh, I just don't see how it's possible any other way. Nuclear is a political question. Uh, Canada is not nearly as sharply turned against nuclear in general as we are south of the border or as most of the Europeans are. Whether or not that will stick or not, I don't know. The problem is even in Canada, it does take 10 to 15 years to build a conventional third generation nuclear power facility. Now, if you change the goalposts, if the technology evolves, think small, small modular, for example. I'm not saying that that is the wave of the future. I'm saying that's a promising technology that if you haven't poked at, you probably should poke at good and hard. The advantage of modular is you can just take a few of these modular units and drop them into a decommissioned 
coal plant that already has all the power transmission and regulatory infrastructure in place, and it, it's, it's a plug-in and you're done. Uh, that is potentially promising if public support will allow it. And no one is going to be able to push that more than you folks. The trick is to not fall into the trap that Southern Company found themselves in when they were trying to build a couple of nuclear power reactors. Um, in my opinion, they didn't engage with the communities enough. They didn't engage with Greenpeace enough. Uh, and the project got killed. So you need a significant, significant political shift. Best way to do that, talk to Granholm. She's open. She has not made up her mind on this technology. All right, so we have one final question, and thank you to everybody that was submitting questions online. There are some great questions that we did not get uh, time for here, but I felt like this question, when it popped through, I actually snorted, and uh, I feel like it's, it's representative of what a lot of folks are probably thinking right now, um, and I hope that everybody leaves today and goes and reads your book um, and, and feels like they come away with some more of the, honestly, some of the questions that we need to be considering. Um, but we're going to end on this one, which is, do you have any good news? Ha! <laughs> uh, the United States is the world's largest energy producer and now energy exporter. The United States has the world's most stable demographic and the largest industrial base. What we're talking about is issues of corporate cultural evolution and adaptation. We've done this before. We can do this again. I am not concerned for the future of this country, and the country that is in the second best position in the world is our number one trading partner, Mexico. We have everything we need in this continent to make this work with the exception of a few raw materials, and most of those we can get from South America. These are good problems. Because you guys, have you thought forward to what it means if we pull this off? We're not dependent on East Asia. The Europeans are dependent upon us, but we're the ones making all the decisions. It's like, you know, for empires of old, this was never even theoretically possible. We're looking in the next 30 years at a complete rewriting of what the human condition means. And the people who take the first steps, you guys figuring out the manufacturing and the electricity question, that is going to set the trend for everything else for the bulk of the rest of this century. This is a good problem. It's a challenge. But even if we absolutely screw the pooch on this, we only have 9 to 15% inflation. The lights stay on, the food keeps flowing. Failure is not a disaster. It would be a failure to seize this epic opportunity. So go get it. Here, here. Okay. Thank you.